Ignorance isn't the same as ignorance, remarked Margaret Atwood. This echoes the universality of collective and individual human experiences in the dystopian texts 1984 and The Unknown Citizen. Welcome fellow dystopians, it's all about literature. Today I will present a new perspective on the flavour of the month, dystopia, concentrating on the novel 1984 and the poem The Unknown Citizen. Our dialogue on this smoky haze Monday morning is about our human experience. Using the post-war texts George Orwell's 1984 and W.H. Auden's The Unknown Citizen, we will compare and contrast and explore how these composers represent ideas relating to the human experience. The concept of knowledge's power resonated with me, as despite these texts sharing a context of mid-20th century, they are still highly relevant today. Think Hong Kong riots, Brexit. These demonstrate the power of knowledge and the burden of ignorance today. In this forum, we will attempt to understand our own human experience by concentrating on both the individual and collective perspective. Firstly, let's examine access to knowledge as a pathway to composer texts. The most knowledgeable have the power to enforce anything that they desire. In both texts, the state possesses all knowledge through its constant surveillance. The power used to define because this power is used to demand conformity from citizens. Intense government control suggests that the state has a power to enforce complete compliance and conformity from citizens. The aim of this policy is to create human beings who will obey without question. In Auden's The Unknown Citizen, our researchers into public opinion are content that he held the proper opinions for the time of the year. The alliteration of P in public opinion and proper opinions combined with the sardonic tone are highly effective in emphasizing the absolute power of the state in this dystopian context. Utilizing the listing of state organizations such as the Bureau of Statistics and the Greater Community, Auden combines jargon with accumulation of government departments to capture the entrapment of conformity. Consequently, this tactic destroys individualism a critical barometer of the individual's human experience. This conformity and lack of individuality as a result of surveillance is reflected in 1984. It was terribly dangerous to think in any public place or in range of a telescreen. The smallest thing could give you away. The use of the superlative smallest effectively emphasizes the extent of the power of surveillance. Indeed, we can see how the technology of the telescreen is employed by the party to constantly survey, watch, and record the actions of citizens. Orwell uses the telescreen as a sinister motif throughout the novel to highlight the, its ever-present nature. Big Brother is watching you everywhere. Through total control, citizens are in a state of permanent paranoia imposed on them by the state, by the party, sorry hence denying them the genuine human experiences of privacy and communal security. The telescreen de demands conformity from citizens through threats of arrest and persecution. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. The anaphoric who controls in tandem with the motif of time in past, future, present, past highlights the overwhelming nature of the party's power. Unlike 1984, the unknown citizen has no technology for physical surveillance, rather instead making use of nameless government agencies, including the press and the installment plan, who record data on all citizens. Likewise, in 1984, this is executed through the hierarchy of faceless government departments, such as the Ministry of Truth and the Ministry of Love. The idea of power and surveillance is linked to historical and social context. The mid 1930s and 40s saw the rise and rule of dictators, dictatorships such as the Nazi and Stalinist regimes. Secret police organizations such as the Gestapo and the NKVD existed to remove political components. This concerned both Orwell and Auden. They feared that this was the only future for humanity, a world in which not only excessive power destroyed human individuality, but also replaced it with an even more dangerous option, collective conformity. The power of thought is mandatory for the individual.
Newspeak in 1984 to control citizens is contrast with the unknown citizen. The party in 1984 applies its knowledge to limit the thoughts of citizens via Newspeak and in turn keep its regime safe from revolution. We see this in, don't you see the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? This rhetorical question in conjunction with Newspeak jargon is successful in disabling an individual's capacity to form independent ideas and feelings. Hence, the attainment of individuality is an impossibility and conformity inescapable. The euphemistic neologisms of good think, meaning political orthodoxy, and joy camp, forced labor camp, reinforce the party's false ideology. The party incorporates highly deceptive jargon into its language of newspeak in order to indoctrinate individuals and stifle potential rebellion. Furthermore, the motif of double think is a prime example of how the party uses its power for power's sake. Even to understand the word double think involved the use of double think. This effectively demonstrates the anomalies in the novel. This concept of psychological manipulation to destroy individuality by reducing capacity for three for free thought. The party is drawing on its knowledge of the power of language to mislead the public and repress them. The idea of collective consumerism is a deliberate state tactic based on economic gain. Its aim is to create a world of compulsive consumers. Unlike Winston in 1984, Auden's unknown citizen had everything necessary to the modern man. A phonograph, a radio, a car and a frigidaire. The unknown citizen experiences a life completely devoid of the natural world. This ploy by the state suppresses a dialogue between human beings and mother nature. Irony and cumulative listing are successful in implementing, are successfully implemented to accentuate the unnecessary items considered must-haves in the modern collective's human experience. The use of listing throughout the poem creates a monotonous tone which is successful in capturing the faceless bureaucracy of this world. References to the installment plan reiterate the idea that consumerism is central to this world, infiltrating every aspect of the individual's life. It is the state's power that enforces consumerism. This allows the government to control the personal lives of individuals and also for its own economic benefit. Consumerism is a collective human experience, focusing on material items over genuine experiences. This links to Auden's concerns about the growth of mass production and subsequent mass consumerism. Knowledge as a human experience resonated with me because we see it in both texts. The misuse of knowledge and information leads to the distortion of truth. Through the evaluation of these texts, a holistic view of the human experience is provided, both individual and collective. I leave you today with a quote from the inspirational Martin Luther King Jr., which will hopefully encourage you to reflect deeply about the power of knowledge in your own world. Nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance. Thanks for joining my discussion today. Please join me again next week for a dialogue on how power works in the 21st century.